just uh, the most ripped off <laughs> in this whole scenario. Um, as far as you said about computers and TVs, we were discussing this with, this with Dr. Gwen last week, and you know I did that as soon as the golf, um, you know, the golf rubbish went down, the, the oil spill. Um, I I parked my car up, and I've never driven it since. Um, these are things that you know just be the change if you can do it do it you know Dr Gwen lives on an Indian reservation now she has absolutely no technology but um, at the end of the day they'll get you anyway she said they're putting up receivers all over the place yeah. uh, you know so also she mentioned that that the Morgallon the Morgallon uh, really enjoys the frequencies coming off our computers and of course we've got all these cheap laptops and things now that throw yeah. massive amounts of radiation so you know, people use these tools. Everyone in here is contacted by a computer, but don't forget to go out and smell the roses and enjoy the sunshine when it's there. You know, it's, it's so, so important. Yeah. Um, we well, must do the, these things. Speaking of the sunshine, too, of course, um, I, I don't know if she was talking about rickets, the increase in rickets, the loss of uh, vitamin, vitamin D because uh, of the necessity of apparently having that directly on the skin of a human if you want to maintain a level that uh, promotes good health. Um, and, and some people say, well, it's not because of solar radiation management. Well, they don't even use that word, but they say, right. term, but they say, oh, no, it's just because people are indoors more. It just seems that the, the, the subtle... The subtle deceptions are so fascinating in all of this because it's very hard to pin anything down. Um, and even if you do pin things down or you present uh, what one would call scientific evidence, it doesn't even matter if it is not coming from the right source or being delivered to the right recipients. It's just amazing. I've never been involved in any activism that is as um, slippery and as difficult to get traction in as this one. Um, and, I, you know, there's a fellow, uh, I just did a, actually, I just had a wonderful um, interlude with a, a dancer. I, I, write, I write and I have a poem called The Earth and Sky Are Lovers. And this woman did this wonderful choreography. We were at the farmer's market today and we did um, four, four uh, presentations of her dance and my poem. And it was such a joyful interlude in all of this science and trying to, you know, bring attention to these issues and really dwelling in that world and to be an artist again was just so joyful and to turn away, you know, for, in a way, it was really turning away from um, the tragedy of it and just uh, basking in the pleasure of being an artist. Are either of you artists in, you know what I mean? I am. I I do a lot of painting. I do a lot of drawing. Yeah, I'm very artistically inclined. And you're right. When you're doing research this heavy and and looking into these types of things, you really do need some type of a positive outlook out outlet. You know, so that to, to kind of bring you back to normal because it can get overwhelming. Yeah, and to find sources for joy in the midst of this. Too. But what I was going to say, besides that we were doing this performance, which was so much fun, oh my gosh, fun, oh yes, I remember fun, um, <laughs> was that there was a, a, a pediatrician who has now retired. He's very much loved in the community, of course. He's a Quaker. He's got all of these, what I would consider, attributes. He will not even countenance this information. I saw him sitting in the audience today at the farmer's market watching our dance and our poem, and of course I'm announcing that this is done by way of an invitation to people to please come to the Sky Symposium next weekend. And, uh, and, t and you're just saying, you know, if you're wondering who owns the weather these days, come to the Sky Symposium. And I'm thinking, this is really interesting. This man who will not even have a conversation with me about the information, and heaven knows that heaven, heaven knows, there's enough available to convince anybody. I mean, well, apparently not, but one would think if they're listening. And he can't get it. He just he just is refusing. And here's somebody who would be considered well-educated. Of course, that can be our doom, too, to be well-educated, I think, too educated. Um, and it, so there's this aspect of, oh, well, that can't be true because someone in our community whom we hold in high esteem, like a physician, won't even countenance this information. It, it really makes it more challenging for those of us who are... Um, 
you know, just really activists to educate ourselves, inform ourselves, and try to get information out. I just wandered all over the place. That's okay. You know, I think probably one of the most misunderstood by the general public, anyway, um, aspects of the whole geoengineering issue is the addition of HARP. Um, so many people don't uh, don't do the research and don't understand, you know, how HARP really plays into this. And so I was wondering if you could give us your little bits of knowledge <laughs> on how ask HARP. You for plays. yours, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my understanding is that some of the um, some of the atmospheric experiments, the use of our um, atmosphere as a physics laboratory, uh, unabashedly. Uh, let me back up for a minute. You may or may not know about the CARE program, the charged aerosol release experiment. It's probably still going on, but in 2009, rather, they were proudly public about it, and this was a cloud that was um, laid out over the Atlantic Ocean, uh, about where Virginia is, although it was visible, this um, sounding rocket, NASA and the Navy sent a sounding rocket up over the Atlantic Ocean, dispersed a cloud of uh, aluminum oxide, as you probably know, one of their, their favorite um, combinations. And right. it was seen by people, I guess the sounding rocket was seen by people all along the coast, even as far north, and this is pretty far north, um, in Massachusetts, people who were saying, what is going on in the, in the sky? Of course, they weren't aware that it was laying down this cloud of aluminum oxide. But because I was following this, I got to read the uh, comments, and I don't have it right in front of me at this moment, but I can paraphrase Paul Bernhardt. He was one of the, Navy, the Naval Laboratory's chief physicists on all of this. And he was so excited. Oh, they were so excited that they were doing this experiment that they could uh, return to month after month to see what happens with this. Um, for, and who knows truly what their purposes were. But um, this cloud of aluminum oxide over the Atlantic Ocean. And he said that if, they, uh, if this is successful, they can continue. It'll be, this opens up a world of possibility about using the Earth's atmosphere as a physics laboratory for exploring, experimenting with plasma physics. And I'm thinking, you're what? You're going to do what? You think that belongs to you? You think that's your playground, plasma physics with aluminum oxide? Excuse me. <laughs> of course, I got very riled up, as you can tell. But other people are like, oh, yeah, well, it's probably important to do those experiments. I'm thinking, where's your common sense? Yeah. So, so anyway, I think it's quite possible that that may have been um, in part for the purposes of HARP. I know people say that when you see the striations, um, it's um, almost like a reverberation of cloud lines, that that is put in place for the purposes of HARP. But honestly, I, I feel really as though I'm certainly not in the inner circle of HARP. Do you have information about um, specific experiments? I don't. You know, I've done the general research on HARP, and I do understand a little bit how it works because we see those cloud formations that you're talking about um, over my area quite a bit. And I'm thinking that the reason for that is because we, um, in Oregon, up here a little farther north of California, happen to be right below um, one of the major jet streams. And I think they probably utilize that, you know, because they get more bang for their buck that way, I think. <laughs> well, you know, when you read about uh, the, there's that, I have another document if people want, I can email it to them also um, from, um, from Rosalind Peterson's research. But it's a 1990 HARP document. It's, again, sort of like the dreaming of what they could do, although I think, you know, this was, uh, th these dreams certainly preceded the 1990s. Um, and they were talking about, uh, oh, they're excited they could actually be, they could manipulate the polar electro jet. And I'm thinking, stop it, you bastards. Or they can, you know, <laughs> but the, you know, the, um, the, elect the jet stream, it's a jet stream that crosses the continent of the United States. The states is responsible. They teach you when you're in second grade for weather. Um, you know, and, and there's the evidence that they're able to control, and I don't know that this is by way of heart, but they can, can they can move um, hurricanes where they want them to go. The results of tomography, the the capacity to, and I guess that's really what Rose was speaking about too, this capacity to 
to create earthquakes to, um, and maybe not with enormous refinement, I don't know how refined they are, but they can definitely jiggle the earth. I know they can do that because they're proud of it. Right, and part of the research that I have done, um, the seismic activity oftentimes may not even be their initial goal when they're activating this, but it is, it is and can be um, a side effect of them, and, and it might be an unintentional side effect in some places, mm -hmm. but it, it can be a side effect. Um, I was reading about one of the very early um, researchers and scientists that were going out to test some of this technology. It just happened to be in the state of Oregon. And the guy, after doing whatever it was that he was doing with the beam and, and directing things, um, redirecting things after the beam was sent this way, um, fired up his equipment and within a few hours there was a uh, quite a bit of seismic activity in the area that he was in, and, and so much so, actually, that it scared him, and he packed up all of his his equipment and left to bet it doesn't happen to them more often. But, but you know, the, the other... story, th I think, yeah. Yeah, the other thing that, that I would like to say, I think probably the biggest misunderstanding as far as the HARP facility goes is when you mention HARP, people tend to automatically think about... Um, the heart facility in Alaska, and for some reason they tend to think that that is the only one, you know, or the right. major one, and and that is not true. There are heart facilities all over the world, and they're going up as we speak. You know, there are new ones going up, and they have also, within the HARP um, technology spectrum, incorporated Gwen Towers, you know, which we know as cell phone towers, <laughs> cleverly uh -huh. disguised as trees and other things. You know, they have learned how to utilize those in conjunction with HARP as well. So when yeah. somebody mentions HARP activity, um, it doesn't, it's not always and isn't necessarily being or coming out of the facility in Alaska. There's several, <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah. Good call. There's even one in the one. Arctic which, you know, I, I just learned about that one recently, you know. And these things go up covertly. They, they obviously don't advertise, you know, that they're doing yeah. this. Yeah. So. Now, uh, Shirley, I'm, I'm guessing that you have seen the film. It's getting a little old now, but angels don't play that harp? I haven't. I've read, um, I've read reviews on it and certain key uh, research. You said I've, I've um, um, 